Thank you, Ilaria. Uh, so um, my name is Hanna Koivula and I come from CSC, which is IT Center for Science in uh, Helsinki area in Finland. And um, I'm here to present the Fair Spare uh, project. And I assume that uh, my slides are uh, visible there now. Uh, and okay. They are changing. Hopefully, uh, you can see them now. So, fair is fair in a nutshell. Um, we are fostering fair data practices in Europe, and uh, the project aims to supply practical solutions for the use of fair data principles throughout the research data life cycle, with an emphasis of fostering fair data culture and uptake of good practices in making data fair. Um, the project started in March 2019 and uh, it will last for uh, 36 months. So we are uh, closing uh, the project early next year. Um, the budget is 10 million euros, 22 partners from eight member states are participating and core partners are DANS uh, who is a pro project coordinator, CSC uh, where I work. Digital Curation Center, a Trust IT, Science and Technology Facilities Council, and European University Association. And um, here are the next, um, uh, the rest of the project participants and their logos. The project is organized uh, into seven work packages. Uh, the generic ones, project management and engagement, communication and uptake are there. And then two cross-cutting uh, themes are fair competencies and fair data science curriculum and professionalization. And then um, other themes uh, is certification of repositories, which is a big work package and data policy and practice. Uh, and then Finally, the uh, work package number two, fair practices, semantics, interoperability and services, which is uh, mostly what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the results come in many shapes and forms. Uh, we've held a data steward school together with CoData and RDA, uh, established a fair data forum for peer uh, support uh, and then recommendations to increase fair practices in academia, addressing fair in higher education, research data policies and support services, universities and the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, then there are a couple of tools. Uh, one is Fair Aware, which is an online tool uh, for data stewards and data producers to uh, test if their data uh, could be better um, semantically interoperable. And then also Fuji tool, which is uh, about, which is an automated fair data assessment tool. Uh, these tools would not be possible without fair data object assessment metrics, which is one of the results of this project. And uh, these are organized um, they are actually the results are based on the EU Commission and the implementations uh, of the recommendations according to the EOSC uh, framework. And then there is uh, trust and fair certification support and also uh, fair interoperability support. Uh, the, all of the results and deliverables and reports are available in Zenodo. Currently, I found 134 uh, documents from there with fair spare keyword. Uh, and um, it's quite handy to refer to them with the DOI. So uh, I can share the presentation. There are a couple of uh, that I will highlight. So uh, then to the actual beef, uh, what is meant by fair semantics? So semantic artifact is a broad term, including research resources such as ontologies, terminologies, taxonomies, thesauri, vocabularies, metadata schemas, and standards. 
They are key components to enabling FAIR, but the semantic artifacts themselves have to be FAIR. So the FAIR principle I2, metadata and data use vocabularies that follow FAIR principles. So FAIR semantics are semantic artifacts which, uh, which adhere to the FAIR principles. And the end goal of the FAIR semantics team is to coordinate both recommendations for making semantic artifacts fair and a set of agreed best practices to follow together with the semantics community at large. Uh, our work is based on the community input and feedback processes. Uh, and with these, we have created uh, versions of the recommendations with, with an iterative process. First version was released in March 2020 and second in January 21. And the third uh, and final one will be released in February 22. And it will contain um, 17 priority recommendations and 14 best, practice rec pra best practices recommendations. One example of how we worked with these recommendations is, for example, priority recommendation number three. A common minimum metadata schema must be used to describe semantic artifacts and their content. Uh, so we used the guiding use case, searching for ontology, uh, and with the starting point of having a community producing uh, science or research community producing data and a domain ontologist uh, trying to figure out how to publish this data uh, in an interoperable and fair manner. Uh, so there needs to be a decision uh, whether to start um, from scratch or and create uh, the needed semantic artifacts or, or whether these artifacts already exist in this field. Uh, a handy tool would be a semant uh, search engine for semantic artifacts, uh, but this would not be possible if these uh, artifacts would not be available in a fair manner. Uh, it, it becomes possible if, if they are well described and we actually know what fair semantics mean. Uh, so we iterated and, and asked the community uh, to prioritize and, and uh, also shape, uh, align these, these recommendations uh, and as an example of changes between the first and second version, um, we prioritized uh, use of common minimum metadata schema to describe semantic artifacts and their content um, as a mandatory uh, property to the metadata schema. And second uh, example is about integrating the idea of trustworthiness for repositories like publishing the semantic artifacts uh, and its content in a semantic repository. And this was uh, proposed to be optional because there are many different ways of publishing and, and we can't really, uh, or the community thought it's not possible to have that as a mandatory, for example. As I mentioned, this uh, is, uh, the project is, on its uh, later stages, but we still have one more release uh, about these recommendations and uh, there are ways to get involved. So there will be uh, one more workshop um, in planning for this winter and all of all suggestions, contributions and feedback are always welcome. And you can find out more from our website. Thank you very much for your attention. Apologies. Here I am. I'm Allison. Is just clearly going to have a quick switch to my actual slides, which I seem to have advanced for you when you get a sneak peek. So here we are. I'm Allison, and I'm the content and community coordinator at Fair Sharing, and I'm going to be talking to you and giving you an overview of how 
uh, FAIR is used in practice within FAIR sharing. And also I'll be passing on to Susanna who will be covering the same top topic with relation to the FAIR cookbook. FAIR sharing is a registry of different resources, data policies, community standards, and repositories. But we don't just store metadata that describes these standards, repositories, and policies, but we also describe the relationships among them. And this produces a, an interlinked network landscape of how a repository um, imports or exports in a particular standard or how a data policy recommends a database or, or a standard. And we have over 3,500 of these resources in fair sharing. And what we're trying to do is to foster a cultural change where the use of these resources for fairer data is pervasive and seamless. Um, we help the producers of these resources to um, have their resource be more discoverable, to have it to show how interoperable it is through the relationships it has with other standards and databases, and to help our users both use those resources and reuse them in their work. To take a little bit of a closer look at our stakeholder groups and how they divide and into these broad strokes. Uh, our researchers, the data stewards, librarians, uh, and society members all come to fair sharing primarily as consumers. And they'll come to fair sharing and to search and discover resources. And that means that developers, data curators, journal publishers, and funders all make use of fair sharing um, through a more producer role. They really want to advertise their resource and we want to help them do that. We want to help our users discover them and find them and use them. To show you how this is done and how we can encourage um, fair within the resources we describe, I'm going to show you a few ways that we group those resources within fair sharing. For example, community organizations, we have a CDISC collection or grouping of fair sharing records um, that shows all of those standards that are relevant to the CDISC community and that are sometimes also developed by them. We also have a collection for astronomy um, that is maintained and created by the International Virtual Observatory Alliance. And that shows all, showcases all of the standards that they uh, wish to, that they recommend. Within the publishing industry, we provide the ability for them to produce data policy records within fair sharing that collect all of the standards and databases that they recommend. Um, not only does that allow our users to, to come and find those standards and databases recommended by a journal, such as uh, if you're an author of a manuscript, but it also allows the publishing uh, industry itself, the publisher itself to discover new resources so they can explore the network graph that is created by their collection of standards and databases. They can navigate through it and discover new resources they may wish to include. They can also refine and update their own collection based on the life cycle status of the records within fair sharing, whether a particular resource is, is deprecated or, or ready. Beyond that, fair sharing is a part of the ISO Technical Committee on Biotechnology. And it's released a formal specification that encompasses all of the semantic and syntactic standards relevant to the data produced by the biotechnology industry. And it utilizes, as you see through its network graph here on the, on the slide, um, a load of pre-existing community standards. There's over 200 that are represented in this graph. And it also not only represents those standards listed in the official ISO document, but it also shows more. It shows the relationships between and among those standards, as you can see from the inset zoom of the CDISC network, as we discussed on the previous, as I showed you on the previous slide. Not only that, but it can show you which resources are deprecated or live or in development. And so it shows a live version of those standards represented in the ISO document. 
We're also working with the Pistoia Alliance, a nonprofit organization of over 100 life science uh, research and development companies that include major pharmas and service providers. And what we're doing is we're creating a collection with the Pistoia Alliance and the Pistoia Alliance's Fair Implementation Working Group. And those collections will show all of the standards uh, that are recommended and in use by various companies that are part of the Alliance. We mainly, I've mainly been talking about the human accessible front page, the uh, human readable website, but we also have an API and our services that are accessible through the API provide lookup and selection of metadata and other information for our standards and our repositories. And these standard, these services are used by a number of our collaborators in the domains of data management plan, data stewardship, metadata aggregation and assessing fairness. I just wanted to end before passing on to Susanna by saying we, uh, we showcase these resources within fair sharing to help enable those resources themselves to adhere to the fair, fair principles and to enable the uh, sharing of fair data. So we allow users to find their resources, to access data because we provide data access information on all of our resources. We allow, we show the interoperability of all of those resources in the registry through the network graph. And we hope that through the use of fair sharing, uh, all of these resources can be used and reused. Um, this last slide, it just gives you an overview of our communities and our groups of adopters and users and the working groups we're a member of. I'm now going to pass you on and control the slides for Susanna, who's going to talk about the FAIR cookbook. Thank you, Alison. Yes, so this is a different uh, project, a different activity, yet is fair related, which is also run by our group in Oxford. This is very much a part also of the Elixir community and funded by a project of Fred Plus. Please, next slide. So what the cookbook is, it's practically been developed by uh, um, research and management professional in the life sciences, in academia and in industry, and these include Elixir member. What it is, it's a live resource, it's an online resource at the moment for the life sciences, because that's the area we started with, and it's a collection of recipe that cover all the aspects of making data fair, putting in practice, because we have a lot of very, very generic uh, guidelines, but very little guidance on making data fair in each of domain and as you can see <clears throat> the cookbook is for everyone <clears throat> it's for the, the doer the fair doer but it's also for um, curator it's also for a policymaker to ad endorsing it it's also for um, mm, a researcher to start learning how to do although it's a very specialized resource please the next slide Excuse my voice. Like I say, funded from the Fair Plus project, which brings together academia and pharma. So this is a private-public partnership. Please, next one. My next slide works as a sort of also acknowledgement of the people that so far have contributed and author of the cookable to their orchid. So they are very much acknowledged. And as you can see, it's a variety of pharma, major pharma company, academia, and, and Elixir member. Please, the next one. So the learned objective of the cookbook, which you can find the, the link I put on the chat, and you can see at your own pace the different recipe, which I, because I'm not going to go through them, it really shows a series of exemplar specific data set in the life science, and now you can make the different step to make data fair at different level. We also talk about indicator, we also indicate open source tools and services that help in the process, and also like the skills which are needed and the challenges. Next slide. It really gives us just a screenshot of the landing page. Everything is organized, not just according to the fair letter, but also according to the infrastructure and the applied example. Each recipe, it's a sort of like, you know, a mini menu within the ingredients, with the complexity, who is it for, and etc. Next one. This is just an example of a recipe that's also been published. So the recipe is not just textual, it tends to be actionable codes and graph as much as trying to be a step-by-step -step guide. And that's really important. The next one, what we are also doing 
within the Fair Plus is to then take the cookbook and applying it on a capability maturity model. This is important because you can't make data fair at the max. You have to make data fair as enough as it you need for your case, for your usability. And so it's a trade-off between capability and the cost and investment that you will have to put. And also this is very important because working in industry where time means money, you need to show the business value or doing certain step or making data fair, what's the value is. So you have to reach the fair enough point. The next one. So I'm just give you a very quick example. That's really my last few slides on showing how we actually uh, help the organization, in this case, the industry, uh, to understand the capability that they need to reach if they need to have more syntactic strength and use ontology in-house. Next slide. Keep going, click, keep clicking. Sorry, one more. It's the last one. Thank you. So, practically, what you can see here is that obviously the model shows that the initial point is you don't use any ontology, then you start using internal ontology. The next level up is to using ontology that other community use, public use as yours. The level up is to have services that manage your ontology with other ontology. Another level up is to have even terms suggestion automatic as the annotation happens. Obviously, the scale on which you need to reach depends on the case you are and what you need to reach in, in terms of organization, in terms of data usability. And what we are doing, we are then attaching the recipe to help the organization to move from one level to another in terms of fairness. And my last slide is to say, if you want to hear more about the, the, the cookbook, uh, I'll point you to a webinar which you have given and also that the cookbook it's now recommended by the IMI, which, as you know, it's European Commission and FPA, pharmaceutical company, as part of their guidance to author. And my last slide, it's really just to give you the link um, to the, um, the, the, the webinar. I'm sorry, I think it's the one after next. But this one is to say, although has been, uh, if you go to the, the previous one, I'm sorry, it, it is to say that although has been um, developed by the people within the Fed Plus, if you are an expert, you can join the community and you can contribute recipe because there is a lot to be built and this is a live uh, a community resource. So you are welcome to join and invited to do so. And my very last slide, it's indeed the link to the webinar if you want to hear more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison and Susanna. Uh, I am Rita Zuffrida, and I'm going to uh, present to you the Commons project and how peer data uh, are applied to it. Uh, so I will share the desktop now, and hopefully you can also see uh, my screen. Uh, I, I just have some problems in making the full screen, but I, 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 uh, I hope that it is OK. Um, uh, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to do the presentation together with my colleagues, Ian Lefranc, Anna Fenzel, and uh, Umu Kantzinsek, always from the Commons project. Um, if we want to uh, say uh, what is the Commons vision in very few words, uh, it is summarized here. Uh, so it aims to overcome interoperability bottlenecks and facilitate data sharing and also, uh, their, um, and also to uh, make, make them more valuable. Uh, and in particular, we're doing this uh, through ontologies, standards, and also applying fair uh, principles. Um, the objective of this project are three main ones. Uh, first of all, is to build a community of experts uh, in this field, especially because uh, this project is a CSA. Uh, and so our aim is really to create a very big community this, uh, involved in this. Then we would like also to create uh, the ontology commons ecosystem uh, that instead will serve as the foundation for data documentation. And I will also provide a little bit more information about this in the next slide. And then uh, we are also proving the effectiveness of the onto commons ecosystem through uh, the demonstrators uh, that Anna and Dumot instead will present to you uh, in the next slides. Uh, the ontology commons ecosystem can be summarized uh, like I mean a pyramid, as you can see here, like a triangle. And uh, you can see that here we are using different ontologies, and in particular they go on different levels. So we have top level uh, reference ontologies and then uh, application level. Uh, in particular, we're also using some specification that explain how to use them, uh, different tools that explain how to build ontologies for the data documentation. 
the Onto Commons project is also composed by 19 partners uh, that are coming from 10 countries, which you can see here. And uh, now instead, we will go through uh, more details of how fair data are applied uh, to the Onto Commons project. And I will leave the floor to, to Ian. Over to um, you, Ian. Thank you, Rita. So um, here I will give a, a short, very short uh, overview of some of the work we do around fair principle within Auto Commons that targets industry. Can you move to the next slide, please, uh, Rita? So one of the work we're doing is to actually uh, collect information about ontologies in the realm of material science and manufacturing. And uh, what we uh, try to do is to assess the fairness of each of these, of these domain specific semantic artifacts. So we started this landscape analysis and we ended up with a corpus of 108 uh, identified ontologies, um, which resulted in 74 of them being in a machine readable format. And as Anna in the first talk actually mentioned, um, semantic artifact must be fair according to the fair principle I2. And so the question we had was how fair are these ontologies and how we can uh, improve the situation. Next slide, please. So what we did in that task is to actually use the fair semantics recommendation that were presented in the fair fair presentation, which is composed of 17 recommendations, nine that are mandatory, six recommended and two optionals. And from them, we identify nine relevant recommendations for specific for ontologies. And we started looking at uh, uh, drafting questions that needs to be answered about the ontologies we analyzed. And we ended up having a 13 questions that would help us uh, score or provide a score uh, about fairness, whether or not they fulfill uh, the answer to the question. Um, so what we did is evaluate manually these 44, 44 ontologies out of the 74 that were uh, machine readable, and we attributed two scores. One is what we called a fair score. It's the percentage of mandatory recommendation covered by the ontology, and the global fair score, which is the percentage of recommendation covered, which includes uh, also the recommended and option. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see in the graph here uh, the score. So 100 person means that they are fair enough, as Susanna was mentioning before. And that you can see that in the four different domains uh, of interest that we actually look into, which means physics and chemistry, mechanical and industrial engineering, material science and engineering, computer science system and electrical engineering, most of the, all the ontologies are not actually fully fair. So they do actually uh, uh, complete some of the recommendation or some, some of the questions. And uh, there is always an improvement um, in the global fair score because they also um, uh, cover some recommended uh, and not mandatory recommendations. So this was done very quickly and we will continue uh, you know, improving this uh, fairness assessment. And the next step for us is to compare our evaluation system with the existing ones, such as the one proposed by Fuji, AgroPortal, and FOOPS, developed by UPM, uh, the University of Madrid. And we would like to start automating the uh, evaluation. And that's all for me. So then I will give the floor to Anna. Anna? Hello from my side. So uh, I will switch to uh, to the work on uh, demonstrators as me and Omachan Sipsik uh, lead the work pack, uh, the task or work package on this one. And uh, the, here it's uh, basically well we work with industrial cases in the certain domains, particularly in uh, um, manufacturing, uh, biotechnology, and a few others, and look how they actually develop uh, use uh, ontologies and semantics and tools. Next one. And um, basically the uh, for the industrial demonstrators, uh, we have uh, well 11 cases currently and uh, we also will be expanding this uh, to more cases and we have started with 11 and try and analyze what they actually do. So which kind of requirements they have to implement 
um, anthology documentation and fair principles, and um, we collect it and put in, in into requirements and um, see how the tools and anthologies are being adopted. Next one. So uh, this is just a brief list of, uh, or, a, or a list of our demonstrators. So that we are following them through the project. Um, and the idea is here to go, well, from lower technology level to higher technology level. This is the expectation. And we actually will follow and see what exactly they are doing and try to help them uh, with linking technical expertise from under commons with their needs. And um, so we have partners like uh, Bosch, Airbus, um, next slide. Um, then uh, also demonstrators um, say um, in nanotechnologies and in uh, more in manufacturing also from different countries, of course. And um, one of them also will be talking at um, this workshop and um, the one for this ATB and OS. Um, so um, these are a few more examples of them. And next one. And so far we have uh, basically, um, well, did a number of interviews and workshops with them and uh, collected the requirements. So this delivery was produced and should be available soon also publicly. And uh, we'll have already, again, uh, this work is in progress. So we, what we already noticed that, of course, uh, many of them have different kind of challenges. Some are repeating um, that um, requirements Well, people are interested, for example, to uh, stick to, to go and be conformant to standards, to uh, have better or being able to implement uh, better interoperability between top level and ologies. Um, people find uh, maintenance of ontology um, well difficult still, and there are there is some insufficient support of collaborative development uh, ontology development tools. So people want definitely to be able to maintain it uh, better, and there is a, a big. Uh, room for improvement as well in terms of fairness for the demonstrators and um, and uh, well Umut will be addressing this in more detail and um, the next one uh, we have uh, now currently call uh, open call for new demonstrators so you feel uh, especially here maybe you have uh, there among uh, audience there is um, people working open science and particularly biotechnologies and uh, related disciplines, it would be very interesting to work with you actually as well on this project. So we have an open call and we are currently um, getting on board around 20 more external um, demonstrators. So it can be um, company, some company developments which you have, um, which is deploying and using ontologies and developing this further. It can be also a new project uh, associated. So this is uh, also good because then for sure you are continuing with, with this work. So now there is an open call. If you check on the website of Onto Commons, um, you will find it very easily. And uh, basically it gives you very good possibilities in terms that uh, you can um, be part of the roadmap which we produced and um, get access to the newest um, technical expertise, um, which is ontology related and semantics related and work with the consortium to increase your technology readiness levels and the readiness of the demonstrator and um, work also the um, with fair data and um, standardization bodies engagement and um, things like this. So, well, this is also invitation um, to, well, check this out. And if you think this is something interesting, we can actually start to talk and also work together um, in this, in on the commons, yeah. Um, then okay. I pass to Mut. Yes, I think I continue from here. So uh, one of the main expected impacts of the project is the fairness uh, as we uh, try for improving interoperability between domains and also between organizations and having fair data and metadata, well, metadata is also data, uh, fair artifacts is quite 
uh, important. And to measure our impact uh, at, at the end of the project, we tried to create a baseline for the, uh, with the initial demonstrators. And we gave them a, a basically survey to measure their uh, fair compliance. If we switch to the next slide, I can give, show an uh, example of this. So we used the, uh, the questions in the survey. We adopted uh, the RDA fair data maturity model guidelines. I think there were 40 of them and uh, or already 42 uh, we added two more uh, we removed one or two and added two more uh, that kind of made sense for the project and uh, within the four uh, dimensions um, and in the next slide we can see an example of this survey how it looked um, uh, we, we use this evaluation um, framework of these guidelines to measure it uh, from zero to four and zero is not applicable and four is fully uh, implemented and survey was conducted through EU survey. And at the end, we used some radar, radar charts um, for each demonstrator to depict their current fair compliance. Again, this was also one of the recommendations from the IDA guidelines, uh, maturity model guidelines. As you can see one example here from the use case of Bosch regarding machine learning, annotating machine learning pipelines to in increase the usability um, of components. Uh, in different manufacturing processes, uh, this is what the use case is about. And from the fairness perspective, as you see the, for example, the red uh, lines uh, show the average of all 11 demonstrators and the blue lines, basically the, what the current demonstrator is. And as you can see, Bosch demonstrator is actually already quite advanced. But um, when we uh, looked at the other demonstrators overall, if we go to the next slide, um, I can show that there is still um, quite a bit room for improvement, uh, but fortunately, majority of the demonstrators were willing to implement the majority of fair principles. So only we had one or two demonstrators that had non-applicable uh, principles. And of course, I mean, we also already seen this is not a bad thing necessarily. We already seen there is this trade-off between the cost and benefit of application of the fair principles, of course. Uh, but there is at least some motivation uh, to implement them, and. Um, we also seen that there are some barriers uh, in the adoption of some air fair principles. For example, some uh, demonstrators cited I IPR issues, which is not necessarily a, a hurdle, but um, and some others uh, cited that they haven't started yet properly thinking about it. So I think in the discussion session uh, later, this is also one of the topics. Uh, we will we will discuss so um, if there is an organizational barriers to adoption of the fair principles. But uh, right now we're in the process of getting the basic the second round of surveys and um, and uh, we will see if last six months there has been any improvement um, towards fairness in the initial eleven use cases. I think this is it with the presentation. Um, as Anna also said, I should also remind you to that you can become our demonstrator if you like. We are, have an open call until September 30th. Uh, please read it, um, see if you fit, and then fill the short form to uh, be part of um, our uh, really cool uh, demonstrators. Thank you very much from our side. Thank you. Um, so now uh, we, uh, Sebastian and Anna uh, from ATB uh, will make also a practical example of uh, fair principles in a uh, industrial demonstrator want to comments. Thank you. Hello. Hello, my name is Sebastian Polke from ATB. Uh, we can't hear you, Sebastian. You can't hear me? Very bad. You're very, very quiet. Very quiet, yes. Uh, okay, is it now better? Yes, much yes. better. Okay, sorry. Uh, so my name is Sebastian Scholze from ATB, and together with my colleague Anna, we will present you this industrial demonstrator uh, from OES and um, also about the fairness. So the first part, I will give you a brief introduction on uh, the company and uh, about this demonstrator. And then about this uh, survey, Anna um, will do the second part. Anna, can you go to the next slide, please? Yes. 
Okay, so OES. OES is a um, SME company uh, and they are specialized in uh, weighing systems, plan construction, process control technologies, and yard management. Uh, it's an SME located in Bremen, so northern part of Germany. And I made this uh, yard management bold because um, that's the demonstrator in Onto Commons. And um, the idea or the goal is to improve the yard management. So OES has a yard management solution. Um, and one of their problems is that each time they install this um, product in one of their customers, um, it needs heavy customization. Um, and then together with us from ATB, um, they decided to um, create a completely new yard management solution. Um, so the yard management uh, next generation. And the idea is to improve um, on one side um, how to configure this so that it's much easier to customize. And the other thing um, to have it more configurable and uh, more standardized data. And uh, what we did, um, we analyzed this um, site definitions of a yard. So um, when you go to the next slide, Anna, I can explain a little bit about yard management. Maybe for some of you, um, if you're not familiar with this, um, in, in factories, usually you need some raw materials and then you are um, working with these raw materials and afterwards you have a product and this product has to be delivered somewhere. And what you need for this is a huge log logistic um, supply chain. And there are some processes in behind. And on um, the upper left, you can see, for example, trucks, um, which have to pass a barrier. And then um, um, they need to go to a weighing system, to a truck scale, so that you know how what is the, um, the weight of uh, the truck. And then depending on what you are transporting towards a factory or from the factory, you have different options. Um, maybe you have to um, uh, load um, different things. Sometimes you need a digger, sometimes um, not. And um, so depending on uh, what is your current task, you have to execute different um, activities. All of these things um, um, need some hardware. You can see all these terminals um, near to the trucks. And for example, a truck scale has specific input and output parameters, and that's fixed. Um, but if you want to work this is, uh, with this, you need something to uh, define such a site. So this, for example, uh, is an example of a site. Um, what we did with uh, OES together is um, we completely uh, developed from scratch a new yard management system and um, these definitions of such a site, um, we, for this we are using an XML format and you can see on the left and a little bit in the background. So for example, if you add the, a barrier, um, the system automatically knows, okay, a barrier um, I can do open close. Um, if you have a um, truck scale, um, um, the system knows there are some functionalities like um, getting the weight, um, setting uh, the, the scale to zero and um, things like this. And by this, um, you can quite easily configure such a complete site. And then uh, immediately um, the system knows um, what type of hardware is there, what type of data can be used. And by this, it's much easier to uh, create um, customized solutions uh, for the customer. And then the relation to um, onto comments, if you have already these um, metadata everywhere available, um, then this can be also used for the data which is produced um, when using, for example, a truck scale or when passing a barrier, because then you immediately have the metadata on top of this. And um, that's the idea to use these, um, especially product service system uh, uh, or dedicated product service system ontologies um, within this demonstrator. Okay. 
Thank you, Sebastian. Um, and I'll just um, I'll, I'll present um, some of the answer, some of the examples of what uh, we had when uh, doing together with the OAS this um, fair questionnaire that Umut was talking about. Um, so we, we answered this uh, with respect to the the data that Sebastian was just presenting. And um, the idea is to see where we were and, and uh, hopefully in the end, uh, we get better results. So um, I, I'm not going to go over uh, all of this, although I, I've just put here some, some examples, but um, I can say that on the accessibility um, of, of data, like for instance, um, that we have all the, the, the metadata and data identifiers resolved to a digital object. Um, as Sebastian has shown, um, they are using um, XML files to, to register this. And so um, this is already available. This XML file is um, used uh, within their software. And um, so of course they, they want it to, to, to be uh, machine readable. Um, also on the findability um, um, uh, scale, it's it's uh, we have already a, quite a good uh, um, level of fairness. So there are identifiers, global uh, unique identifiers for most of the data, for all the data. Um, so things that are being implemented have to do with with the harvesting and indexing of the data. But then uh, on the interoperability um, and the reusability um, scales, it's, it's not really uh, very good, as you can see from, from um, uh, the graphs and, and the answer, especially here in reusability, um, because it's not really com uh, complying to, to community standards. Um, so and and the main reason for this uh is uh that um so the reason to to have good uh, findability and and uh, accessibility is like i said uh it way as is using this in their uh, internal software development and their products um and the reason why interoperability and reusability is not so good is because um it's mainly it's it's only used um internally up to now it's something that grew over time because they um well they they started developing uh one yard at a time so but now with um uh, more uh, uh sites to 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 define and and so that they, they are really thinking on the long term to have um some ontologies um and and follow some standards uh behind this and this is where they are lacking and where they want to 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 go so uh the challenge here is how to improve interoperability um outside of the as ecosystem and reusability because um, they want maybe then to connect with the client uh, system uh, at, at some point. And so um, the opportunity that we see here for uh, the OS demonstrators that we use um, the um, methodologies and tools and, and uh, uh, the main ontologies um, that are being studied and, and developed um, within Onto Commons to be able to, to, to create this and um, yeah, so facilitate interoperability in the end by, by using uh, qualified references to other metadata. So go outside of, of OAS and um, yeah, go for for some community standards so that it can be um, at some point uh, used by by um, also together with with their clients and who knows. Okay. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, now, instead, um, we will pass the floor to Martin, who he said will explain, will show how we can bring uh, industrial innovation in the open science. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Yes, driving innovation with open science, that is a big title. And uh, I have 10 minutes only, so I will restrict myself to making a few remarks that are also related to one of the 
onto commons demonstrators. Um, if we look at the topic and aim at optimizing industrial innovation based on open science, then one of the ways in which we can look at it is in terms of the digital value chain. That's the value added chain over data. Uh, here we have the field of catalysis. This is part of a representation from the work on a research data infrastructure for catalysis. And uh, clearly here you have different types of data depending on the level at which you are considering uh, chemical reactions and uh, chemical processes. And this could be seen as a chain propagating from the bottom up. And you could assign a value added chain a, a direction in that sense. In reality, particularly if you need to establish trust in the accuracy and reliability of your data and the underlying modeling and other scientific approaches, you need to go from the top to the bottom and from the bottom to the top. So it's in that sense, it is not a unidirectional chain. What is important is that you need to represent your knowledge at every level. And for that reason, semantic artifacts and metadata standardization are a key element to the optimization of interoperability and reusability. And uh, here you see an analysis of the pre-existing semantic artifacts at those different levels. And uh, here there's a challenge, it's a heterogeneity challenge, and sometimes also it's a challenge in terms of incompleteness. So heterogeneity is the greater problem. These and similar issues are being considered in the German National Research Data Infrastructure Program, where the main aim is to actually build storage platforms and repositories that will host and make fair all the data from all the academic disciplines in, at a national level in that case. And there are disciplinary research data infrastructures in particular for our field in, uh, uh, if you say materials modeling is our field, then catalysis and engineering are most relevant, but all the disciplines from the academic field are integrated into this. Now we like to look at this certainly at the European level. And here we have to look at the Horizon work programs, particularly from the Horizon 2020 work program. Uh, one important branch was NMBP, which was under light. Uh, that is the program that also includes onto commons. And now, if you look closely at all the calls, then you witness that while it pushes in the direction that we all advance, sometimes expectations are surprisingly unrealistic. Here we have one of those calls and just highlighted, for example, that it expects by building uh, some kind of platform that the speed for material development from concept to market will be increased by a factor of five. Now, even if you increase research and development by infinity, you cannot go from concept to market in uh, five uh, in a, uh, one fifth of the time because you need to build a production capacities and uh, and you need to advertise your product or other related tasks. So here, when you have a hype, there are exaggerated expectations. People who realize that uh, fair data and interoperability are important suddenly think that it is the only thing. And so this is something that you witness very often in technology uptake. You have this sequence set here, maybe slightly exaggerated way uh, is first the nerds talk of it, then the decision makers talk of it, but not necessarily intelligently. Sometimes they project anything. Think of politicians that we know it very well. Also other decision makers, it can occur to them. Then the idea propagates, and eventually also the decision makers understand it. Two, accelerate this process, 
we need to advise the decision makers so that, for example, their objectives become realistic. If they're not realistic, we also face the risk of disappointing and that would produce a setback. So that's very important. Clearly here at the Open Science Fair event, everybody is aware of many initiatives and particularly initiatives under EOSC. Here we have, for example, the EOSC interoperability framework, which does provide such a guidance and contains recommendations and priorities. And if you look at this, you find that the priorities concerning semantic interoperability or interoperability at large target heterogeneity, harmonization within a discipline, but also particularly across disciplines, formality, precision at which you work, and uh, alignment and help at using ontology-based knowledge representation in practice. If we look at the NMB program, NMBP program, excuse me again, then uh, here we have a family of uh, platforms that are developed. And at the core, we have uh, coordination support actions, including Onto Commons and the coordination support action that establish the European Materials Modeling Council. And at the core, connecting diverse components, we have marketplaces. There are two materials modeling marketplaces from that program, WIMP and the project that is called Marketplace and one data marketplace, which is called DOM 4.0. And uh, facilitating this interoperability approach, not only between those marketplaces, but also uh, encompassing this, this whole landscape. This is the Onto Commons demonstrator number five. Uh, if we look at now, the WIMP marketplace, one of those, uh, but this is the same for, uh, or very similar for the analogous second project, which is called Marketplace. Here, this targets bringing services related to materials modeling to industrial end users and helping academics acquire industry funding so that both sides benefit, but how can this be done? Certainly not only by putting up a nice website and a digital infrastructure a repository. No, you need an actual human in the middle. And here this is called the translator and the process is called translation. This uh, has been pursued at, at length, this strategy by the European Materials Modeling Council, which has issued guidelines. This is not semantic interoperability as such, but you could call it pragmatic interoperability because it sorts out what the role of a translator should be and what the different stages, for example, and elements of a translation process should be. Translation here meaning this connection between the uh, model provider and the end user. There are also semantic inter interoperability aspects to that in that when you document, document these elements, then you need to adhere to certain templates and these have also seen an ontologization. In this case, it is the materials modeling translation ontology. And this is one of the domain ontologies from the WIMP project, which encompass as the uh, semantic space that is characterized, everything that will ever require representation at a digital platform like the virtual materials marketplace. So these data and metadata can be really diverse. And for that reason, a uh, family of domain ontologies is required. And it is part of this approach, governed, guided by the European Materials Modeling Council, that the EMMO is used as a top level ontology. The EMMO until very recently was known as the European Materials and Modeling Ontology. The name to be used from now on is elementary multi-perspective material ontology. And this is one of the top level ontologies that are carefully studied by uh, Otto Commons and considered for alignment at a top level with other top level ontologies like BFO and Dolce. Another part that is very important when we come back to the initial point of having accurate and trustworthy models is provenance characterization. I cannot go into detail for that, but in my view and the view of my colleagues, this is a key 
uh, bottleneck, if you so want, to industrial uptake of materials modeling and uh, of using many kinds of data. This would be counteracted by epistemic fairness. Epistemic fairness is the opposite of epistemic opacity, which means, in essence, that you're not sure why you should think that you know something. That is epistemic opacity. Epistemic fairness means that the provenance is documented and that therefore you know why, whether you know something or uh, in which way you know it. For that reason, documentation of research data provenance is in, at the core of much of this effort. And I would like to conclude with pointing to the Doric principles that uh, we've written up within uh, Onto Commons related workshop recently, including the objective of uh, or the goal of formulating realistic objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, so uh, um, now uh, we will move into a more interactive session. Um, and for this reason, we also need uh, the support of all of you. Um, and uh, I don't know if you have used a tool that is called the Slido, but actually we're we going to use it uh, right now for the next 30 minutes. Uh, in order to access it, it you need to log in uh, to one website, which I'm going to share right now here in the chat. And in the meantime, I will also start sharing the desktop. Um, maybe Rita, we can also check whether or not there are any questions for the speakers <laughs> from the audience. Yes. Thank you. Any questions or comments from what about what you have heard so far? I see Alessandro. Alessandro, please go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Maybe I uh, didn't pay enough attention, but uh, in how much does the documentation of uh, a resource, a semantic resource such as an ontology, go into the evaluation of a fairness? Because one of the major problems that we had in uh, using some of the ontology in material science and engineering was the lack of documentation for these ontologies and examples. Uh, a lot of thought goes into designing an ontology that more in the end stays in the head of the person that kind of made it or in that team. And without examples of usage, it's really difficult uh, to, to make use of them. Okay. I, I agree. I think this is reflected in the fairness assessment we did on domain ontologies in material science. Uh, it turns out that a lot of these ontologies do not have proper metadata. So you just have a list of terms and some relations and that's it. And there is no explanation at all. And so that's why uh, there is some work done in the Ferris Fair uh, project. Um, and I know also that uh, there are several best practices that are actually pushing for better documentation of, um, of the ontologies themselves. But I agree, it's a real challenge. I mean, if we want to start working and talking about uh, semantic interoperability or start reusing ontologies that have been developed by others, they need to be documented. And you know, as you would do for data, you would provide all the information on how you acquired it. Then you should provide the same kind of information for uh, ontologies so that you can understand how they've been used, which will explain how they have been designed, right? So I agree with that. So, and one of the things that uh, I can uh, propose is that uh, there is still a time for uh, uh, contributing to the fair semantics recommendations. There will be more workshops organized uh, as Anna uh, explained in the first uh, talk. So I think it's an opportunity to bring that up and see how we can resolve that what exists already. I know that in uh, the biomedical domain, there's been a lot of discussions about that and there are recommendations that exist. Now, maybe they should be used in other domains so that actually we get better documentation. Any other question or comments or? Okay, 
So the, the point of this session is to actually discuss and interact now on the, the idea of applying fair principles in open science, of course, but also how open science can uh, be used by industry, which is one also one of the goals of the European Commission, where they want to see all the research data that's been funded to be valorized whenever possible in other contexts. So um, um, no, no comments on that. If not, then we'll go to the Slido. There will be questions, so we will get them answers. Um, Rita? Uh, yes. Um, in the meantime, I, I was sharing uh, one link uh, here in the chat, so all of you can start um, logging into Slido. Um, and then if you have, uh, if you prefer instead of using a, a mobile phone, you can also do it uh, by actually uh, clicking on this uh, QR code. So once uh, you have entered, um, we can actually start asking you uh, the first question. And then uh, all the questions are actually open, open questions, so you can uh, write as much as you want. Okay, so if we are ready, um, we will uh, start with the first one. Sorry. Um, Okay, uh, so um, we are actually asking you now, what are the benefits that you expect from the fair principles? Okay, it seems, by the way, that we do not have any, any people. Uh, the, uh, just a I minute mean, uh, to understand. Okay, so good. <laughs> We're starting to have someone on board, good. Okay. So we have a uh, first comment that the three principles allow to benefit, strictly speaking, good. Uh, and then we also expect fairness. And then we also have a comment about the increased ontology use. OK, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> it is also an interesting comment. Uh, we will still wait for other comments of yours uh, for another couple of minutes and then we will move uh, to the next question. Uh, if you have already commented, uh, it is not a problem because actually you're allowed to uh, include how, how many inputs um, you want. Uh, so we also see that someone said that uh, it is ease of access to quality data for data scientists. And then uh, that we can also use some guidelines on how to achieve more fairness. Also how to allow machine, machine actionable data. Uh, yeah, and if in, in the meantime, you'd like also to make some comments about the, um, the replies, let's say that we're getting to, to this question, feel free. Sure, I mean, the same applies also to our colleague speakers. Yeah, of course. So please do not hesitate if you have any comments you'd like to make. Okay, so I see okay. the clarity about how data should be shared, which is indeed uh, one of the key features. Interoperability of resources. In which context, actually? That would be the question. And for what do you need interoperability? Data use, yeah. So we, we are also, let's say, we also got some uh, comments about the importance of uh, reuse the data and make them interoperable. Good. Okay. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your input. So now we can move also to, to the next uh, question. Um, here is a we are really interested to know uh, if you're already using some tools uh, to implement your principles, and if so, uh, what is the name of, of uh, all the tools that you're using? Uh, again, also for this question, it is an open question, and you can actually um, include how many inputs uh, as you want. You, you, you can also type no, and so then we know that you're not going to, you're not using any tools right now. I'm not aware of any, uh, like a tool directing, directly, you know, aiming to implement fair principles. Uh, I'm not sure if this ever is going to happen uh, because 
uh, I don't think this is um, every organization have different ways of um, implementing this in a sense. And I think a generic tool for this would be uh, quite difficult. But when you think about it, um, I would I was gonna say not pet because I mean as a joke, but also uh, partially true <laughs> because uh, you start with basically creating machine readable and machine understandable metadata typically uh, or you can use protege for example for this um, I honestly don't think anyone has I use this tool to implement fair principle answer to this so uh, I would see this as a more um, guideline driven uh, approach than uh, picking a tool and doing basically what is uh, doing that. Uh, fair aware. I mean, for, for I'm also talking about right now verification of fairness. So this is something else, but more towards implementation uh, of the fairness, of course. I wasn't aware of Argos. I will take a look. Um, but maybe Rita and Jan refer to more uh, semantic tools. If Perhaps if you are more specific, then we are able to give more specific yeah, answer it, it could be indeed semantic tools or yeah. um, well the idea was to to pick up any tools that would help improving fairness so you find ability and, and this kind of thing so yeah. for, instance, for example c can exactly so c is an tool. example of one of the tools but again these are more specific to one so c can of course provides metadata uh, that improves especially like findability etc mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm not sure if this is their main. So the purpose of CCAN is to implement fairness, fair principles, or it's just a, some some nice thing that comes with it, in a sense. Uh, yeah, if I may say, way before <laughs> fair <laughs> principles. Yeah, sorry. And if I may, if I may add something, um, most of the companies, um, so industrial companies, maybe they are implementing something like um, uh, I was presenting with, with OAS and, and already good in some on some level on fair, fairness principles, but they don't know it's fair. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, um, yeah. I see there are some proposals like data repositories. Indeed, these are great mm -hmm. tools for improving fairness because you share the data yes. and you can access it uh, easily. Uh, common repo providing guidelines and documentation. This is great. Then wall genus and fair data point. Oh, fair data point. Interesting. So that must help, yes, for me to take care of clinical studies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Yeah. So maybe one also as onto commons, one of our part of our roadmap could be to basically provide recommendations towards tool uh, developers, particularly repository developers. To mm -hmm. actually provide this uh, fair implementation out of the box once you put data in it. Okay. And this, um... Yeah, so there, there is some work that is done in Fair is Fair actually, uh, trying to link uh, repositories with uh, the fair data points, which would definitely improve fairness of repos. Mm -hmm. um, oh, actually, international oh. data spaces as well. interesting um, i mean as you can see there are so many different tools that are targeting uh, some aspects and i think this is uh, probably also cookbook uh, list lists i took a look a little bit and um, um, each of them could help from one perspective to improve fairness but i think as a uh, like a uh, blanket approach, the easiest thing to target here would be the repositories mm -hmm. um, to enable them basically provide as much as possible out of the box experience with FAIR once the data is in. There, there must be also some semantic tooling and so that's what we are looking into on the commons as well, are trying to having this uh, ecosystem of tools defined so that mm -hmm. actually um, people can work with these tools or orchestrate them so that they can come up with uh, proper ontologies that would be fair or that would contribute to the fairness of this. Okay. Okay. So, so maybe we can move on to the next. 
Yes. Uh, so um, this one you said is uh, about the hurdles um, that people, let's say, researchers are uh, facing uh, whenever they're implementing FAIR principles. Um, so, for, for example, so before when we were presenting goals so to Commons demonstrator, we were also sharing that uh, we were also facing some challenges. So, of course, implementing the FAIR principles is useful, but um, considering case by case, we can also find some um, some problems, let's say. Uh, so if you ever face some of them, some challenges, uh, feel free also to share your, your experience. And again, I mean, as also for the other questions, you can um, uh, type, I mean, how many uh, replies as you want. Um, and also let's say, if, if for example, you find a challenge and then you, you overcome it, it will be also uh, very nice to, uh, to hear from you about it. Uh, so the first one is about the legal issues regarding data access and agreement between stakeholder. Yeah. <laughs> It, it is a relevant point. Um, the principles are explanational by nature, real examples in practice are needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> also, that's true. Uh, then, little media benefit to data software owners. Okay. So, uh, for the person made this comment, do you mean that, for example, the benefits will be seen more in the long term? Uh, so, then uh, people, I mean, uh, are not willing face, I mean, issues because in the short term they cannot see any benefits and then, I mean, they have to wait for a little bit longer time. Let us hope that they will see uh, benefits in the long run. But when I tell people we should uh, change uh, simulation codes so that outcome is annotated and, and other things and change the existing legacy solutions, that this requires an effort. Sometimes they cannot conceive of any benefit at all. It's just work. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the benefit is not directly for them sometimes, so it's for their users, right? So they might not see that as well. Um, and that relates to what Susanna was saying about the FAIR cookbook. Uh, and when you look at practicalities, then implementing FAIR principles has a cost as well. So you have to strike a balance between the benefits and the cost. So. And it, we also got a comment about the time, I suppose. Uh, and then the, 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 there is also an interesting comment about the cultural problem uh, that, yeah, as we said, I mean, very often they can see more as a burden and then as an opportunity. So it is also linked to the cultural change here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, here we have challenges in describing the metadata and ontologies uh, and cleaning up the data from different equipment and application domains. Okay. Because it is, I mean, of, of course, I mean, if we will automate everything, we would also uh, support in terms of <laughs> cost and um, timing, I would say. And also, that's why it's important that the ontologies or the metadata schemas are fair themselves, because that will reduce the challenge, because you will be able to find uh, ontologies that you could reuse or metadata schema you could reuse that have been developed by others that could fit your needs, uh, maybe with some tweaking, but you don't have to redesign everything. I, mean, I also kind of, I just saw the last comment, like the reach the fair enough level. I completely agree because uh, we've seen like in the previous talks also, just for the sake of making something fair, uh, just, I mean, making something fair just for the sake of making something fair uh, would probably wouldn't convince any decision makers in a sense. So for example, we have seen uh, in the OAS example, OAS example, where interoperability was low because they didn't need to be interoperable in the beginning. And once uh, the use case comes to that, then it is relatively easier to uh, explain this to people. So um, 
Yes. So uh, first of all, I guess uh, it has to be defined maybe as an approach. What really fair enough means, yeah? and um, um, I guess you could say like if everything everybody implements the essential ones, essential principles, this will be fair enough. But again, uh, this is still this essentials are decided by some consortium, uh, generically in a sense, not tailored to specific. Uh, organizations and uh, like similar to ontology development process this approach like um, using some sort of competency questions approach uh, would be i think beneficial to define really what's what is fair enough for that organization for the use case this would be also easier to uh, demonstrate its its benefit in a sense that uh, look we did this so we had this problem uh, maybe in a better approach, you can show like we have this problem and uh, the solution to this problem is applying this and this and this and this fair principles. And uh, instead of maybe providing, of course, generic guidelines are quite useful, but uh, when it comes to uh, more practical applications in organizations, uh, guidelines, guidelines in the form of this, you know, I have this problem and these are the guidelines if I apply this towards fair, then I solve this problem. And this, I think, also uh, reflects uh, well from uh, organizational side of the things, uh, from decision maker side of the things. I, I, if I can add something, Umuka, this is Susanna. I, I've added those comments in the, in the, in the poll. I, I think you're absolutely right, but also we need to be careful because, you know, even if you look at, you know, adding, like I say, terminology, uh, control vocabulary to describe metadata. Okay, let's take something simple, seed of free text term. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard to say you tick the box because the level of granularity, so what you need to replace from free text to ontology really depend on your questions. So mm -hmm. depend on what you want to query because you can maybe only few elements on your in your data set need to be uh, semantically annotated so they can be better linked, better interpreted, better queried, but not everything. If the purpose on your case is just discover using those metadata elements, if it makes sense. So I think the depth by which you have to enrich a data set semantically really vary, depend on your question. And obviously from the same data set can be can become you can have different level of fairness depending on what question you have on the data set if or the use case you have. And that's why it's so difficult to give guidance, you know, genetic guidance. Yeah. Yeah, this definitely, I mean, uh, it's also hard to understand for uh, many organizations I've seen. So what does this mean for me, right? So I see, for example, it says machine readable uh, metadata um, or metadata from an ontology. And this has to be translated on the organization side. So what does this mean for my organization, right? And um, I guess maybe this is too expensive to have these people to do this in a sense. And without this clear benefit to show, it's also hard to convince people to invest uh, in this. In a sense. Well, maybe one of the key advantages of actually getting the data into uh, following up the fair principles that you will reduce the cost in data wrangling, data cleaning, data because with proper data management, uh, these activities that represent most of the work of data scientists in companies, for instance, uh, then they will be reduced because the whole idea of the fair principle is that all these data sets and all this data is actually in machine actionable format so that you can just you know, create clients that can go query, fetch, aggregate, and then analyze uh, specific data. And so I think that's also what we need to, to, to explain about the FAIR principles, right? And that's what we need to keep in mind. But I agree on the, the idea of the FAIR enough, and that's something that we had discussed uh, regarding the FAIR semantics, for instance. We organized a workshop in June uh, where the idea was to define the minimum metadata for ontologies to be FAIR, minimally FAIR. So what is the minimum information you need to provide on ontologies so that actually they are self-described? And if you want to add more, that's perfect. If you are just using that, you're fair. And above, you're fairer. So you need to set a threshold. Otherwise, it's an infinite. Uh... 
infinite loop of, oh, you need to add this field because I need to make that query. And <laughs> so, yeah, but I agree with that as well. Thank you all for, for, the, for the interesting discussion. We still have a couple of minutes. Um, mm -hmm. And we have actually the last question. So maybe we can just um, yeah. quickly also to the last one and then we can close the, um, let's say the, the meeting. Uh, hearing is that it, it is always linked to the issues, but in this case, uh, we would like to hear more about the open science data in industry. Um, if you have I mean, experienced something like this, uh, but in this other, let's say a little bit different context. Yeah, maybe maybe on the so we can see it both ways. It's like experience of industry using open data, open science data, and open science data being used by industry, meaning industry contacting the owner of the data and trying to work out with this in case there has been some experience already on that. So I see the first thing is trust in the data. Yeah. Mm, that's can I ask the person who put that on Slido to actually uh, clarify or maybe share an experience? Or... Jan, this is me again. Ah. So uh, coming from molecular modeling and simulation, we can do a lot for industrial end users, mm -hmm. but we have to establish how correct our methods are. And for that, we okay. need to create trust I in agree. a mathematical way. I see now. Okay. okay. Uh, that uh, we, we still really have another couple of minutes. If someone would like also to add something uh, or let's say comment on what Martin just said, uh, feel free. So Martin, uh, so, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Well, I'd like to comment. So what do you exactly mean? I mean, in the map, because the trust level is like, trust that it actually comes from the source that uh, actually so that you are you basically you say this data comes from Fraunhofer but how do you prove it like cryptographically that's one of the problems we have in this uh, data marketplaces is actually the trust in the data provenance that it truly from uh, who said it is and then there is like a mathematical proof that your simulated or computed data is actually correct according to the algorithm or the process mm -hmm. you did it uh, like that uh, so for example for uh, materials testing that if you perform the tensile test and you said that it's according to a specific ISO standard that you can prove to providing all of the metadata for each step that actually your testing procedure conformed to the standards so I guess there are multiple layers of trust here I can only confirm that. And the, uh, the second issue that you mentioned is what I call uh, epistemic fairness, that you document the provenance and in this way, you document why it constitutes knowledge. Just as a warning, this creates enormous amounts of metadata um, and really complicated ontologies that you document the entire method and procedure. It's again a question if the data then is fair because for some uses, that data is extremely hard to interpret. Yeah, but uh, if you look at this, so the, it's like yeah, for, for computational analysis, you have workflows. Um, the idea is to actually make sure that you can reproduce things. So there are trusts, but maybe also um, at least for computational data linked with reproducibility of data, right? So that you will be able to be able to reproduce exactly the same results from the simulation so you can start building on top. So for instance, if you look at uh, things like the research object, uh, the idea is to encapsulate as much provenance and metadata as possible to one object that would actually provide all the information you would need to um, to reproduce or document enough so that you can reproduce and use. I, I agree for uh, computational data um, that's relatively structured, 
But if we're talking about scientific workflows where you also need to document uh, the human factor in it uh, and mm. each step of the process, it adds another layer of complexity. Um, it's really important to do it and until now it hasn't been really done, but it's of course not easy and it adds a lot of uh, information also to the ontologist. True, true, I agree with that. But then would there be a solution that could pop up so without all that burden? There isn't a solution, but we uh, came to the conclusion that we need to provide different levers of granularity for the information. So basically, we cannot provide the full information for everyone because they couldn't use it if they wanted for most of the application that we do. So we need to provide different levels of description of the data and granularity to be fair to different people just because the complexity would be a hindrance for many use cases. Uh, so, so sorry if I interrupt you. Actually, I see that Ilaria uh, raised their hand uh, because actually um, we uh, let's say we're supposed to uh, finish our workshop at, at 6 p.m. Um, so well, most probably, I, mean, I will also stop sharing. And I, I am sorry also to in, interrupt all of you because the, um, all, all the discussion that was very now was really interesting, but unfortunately we have the time and this is also uh, let's say that that, that arrived at, at an end. Uh, so th th uh, thank you a lot, everyone, for joining this meeting. And uh, Ilari, I'm not sure if you would like also to. Uh, yeah, no, I would like to thank you because this discussion is super interesting, and uh, I, I mean, I'm really into ontologies and so on. So I really enjoyed being in this workshop. But yeah, I'm afraid I have to to stop because I have to start a demo. So <laughs> okay. I'm stopping the recording.